I didn't realize that you could do both and have both uh, at the time. I just, I kind of felt like it was one or the other and I was afraid to get back into something that would like totally consume me. But what I've realized is that, that building my legacy and building this business has been so great for me personally, but also for me as a mom and especially for me as a spouse. Welcome to the Millionaire Enlisted Podcast. Today we have a great episode um, with Erin uh, uh, Kelly, and she was an active duty um, Army officer, and uh, she has an exciting story, uh, something that a lot of us can relate to. Uh, if you're in the military, even if you're a, if you're a civilian with a nine to five job, um, so we'll let Erin uh, tell her story. But before we do that, please. Uh, hit the subscribe button and leave us a review. Um, and so, uh, Erin, go ahead and tell us your story, how, how everything evolved with you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys so much for having me and giving me this opportunity. I'm really excited. Awesome. So, absolutely. We got you here. Thank you. Yeah, so like you said, I'm Erin, and I am currently living in Monterey, California. I am an Army spouse. My husband is still in the Army. And I went to West Point first and then served in the army for eight years on active duty before going to the reserves for a couple years and had, um, had a lot of fun in the army. I really enjoyed it. And we wanted to try to do the dual military thing as long as we could. And then we had a baby and everything changed and we both were put on orders to deploy and just realized that we, there, there really wasn't a chance that we were both going to leave her. And I couldn't imagine even leaving her for a couple of hours much less a couple of months. So we, um, I immediately resigned, told my husband one evening when I got um, my orders via email and I told him that night we were, we were on a walk and we just decided that night. So I resigned the next day and I was out within about five months, which was, is a very quick turnaround for those of you who have done that. It usually takes a little while to get out. I, and my, um, my resignation was received and accepted like within a couple of hours. It was a very, um, anticlimactic sort of non-event. Uh, and so I was a little bit bummed about that, but here I am now a couple years later. It was a, it was a bit of a tough transition. Um, I basically dealt with a lot of transition of, transitions at once, you know, leaving active duty, becoming a mom, becoming a stay-at-home mom, and then having a deployed husband. So it was, it was hard. I lost my, my network really quickly. Um, so if there's anything I can any advice I can give to people who do transition, like hold on to that network because that makes such a difference and being around like-minded people is really important. And so I went probably a good year and a half before I got into real estate. And once I got my, found my network again, which mostly now I'm working with other military people in real estate, other um, either people who are still active duty or veterans now and found that network again, feel like I'm where I'm meant to be. And that's made a huge difference. Um, but anyway, I started small a couple years ago. I bought a single family home that rented right away. I literally drove from closing over to Lowe's to get a, get copies of the keys made and then drove to the house, had my tenant sign the lease and it's been rented every day since. Um, and I've done the, the next thing I did was a flip and I've done a couple of flips and bought um, pretty much everything from single family, duplex, triplex, quadplex, up to tenplex, and um, help other people do the same now. That's awesome. Let me, let me bring it back a bit to something that you said and kind of resonated. So you lost your network. Um, a lot of people, you know, you, and you say like-minded people that you have to be around. When you left your network, um, left the RV. A lot of people think, oh, okay, you know, I'm going to stay in touch. And you do with certain people. But um, a lot of it has to do with mindset. Is that why you lost your network? Is that, you know, ha -ha. what do you say to people getting out? Like, hey, you know, you, what, what do you recommend there? Yeah. So, I mean, that's exactly it. And I don't, I think most people don't realize that, you know, especially in the army, you're around people that are very like-minded. Like it's a pretty, um, it takes a, a special type of person to do that. And so, you know, inevitably we all are pretty similar, driven in similar ways and things like that. And then just, just speak the same language. So when I got out of the army, I went from hanging out with a lot of like 
um, really career oriented people to hanging out with mostly stay at home moms whose, whose goals were to, um, homeschool or just, you know, whatever, whatever their, um, respective goals were within their, their household. And it was just something that wasn't ever really something uh, on my plan, on my agenda. And it wasn't something that I, that sat well with me. I, I was a stay at home mom for a good year and I was not very good at it. And I really struggled with it. And then having the guilt of dealing with the guilt associated with that and not enjoying this time home with my kids was something I had a really hard time with. And then hanging out with all these other moms who like seem to just love being home with their kids and love like, you know, doing the things at home and supporting their spouses and things that I just didn't, I wasn't really good at um, and didn't really enjoy was, it was hard for me. And so I didn't realize that you could do both and have both uh, at the time. I just, I kind of felt like it was one or the other. And I was afraid to get back into something that would like totally consume me. But what I've realized is that that building my legacy and building this business has been so great for me personally, but also for me as a mom and especially for me as a spouse. I dealt with um, some pretty significant resentment when I got out of the army and my husband stayed in and his career literally took off right when we had our first daughter and mine came to an abrupt stop. And that was hard to to deal with that, like seeing him come and go every day. And he And he missed it a lot. You know, he missed us a lot. He missed you know, being able to be there every day, but I felt the opposite. I was like, well, I get to be here all the time. And it just, it was monotonous and redundant and I struggled with it. And so I now have realized like I have a a better balance between, you know, personal, my personal life, my family life and my business, but my business is so grounded in my family and so like foundational to everything I want for my family that it's just, you know, contributed positively to all of that. That, that so, is amazing. My, my wife so and I are doing uh, military as well. And, you know, that conversation, it comes up all the time. One of us gets out. How do we do this? And my wife, she, she thinks just like you, you do. So, you know, props to you for having the courage to do what you want to do and taking care of your family. Sure. Yeah. yeah, you should totally connect us because it's, it is a tough transition. But now that I am where I am and I'm settled and I'm content with what I'm working on it, I, I think the grass truly is greener for me personally and for our family. And it is tough to make that tr- transition and it does take a, a lot of guts, but it, it is worth it most of the time. Erin, so um, how, so you, you got out, you got out, right? You were a stay, uh, stay home mom. Why, why real estate? How do you find real estate? So real estate was something I always was interested in. I've been around construction my whole life. I come from a family of entrepreneurs, um, a family of iron workers and construction people. And I was always interested in it, but just never, I guess just never like dove in. So I, I probably looked for two years before I bought my first property and I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have anybody anybody really close to me that was doing it or doing it well. And so, and most people were trying to deter me from it. Like, Oh, that's really risky. Are you sure? Especially now that you don't have an income, are you sure you want to be risking this? And so I let a lot of people talk me out of it for a long time. Um, and then I also worried that I was going to have buyer's remorse. I, I'm like, I'm the person who I saved up for a long time to buy a pair of Uggs. And then I didn't even make it out of the store before turning around and returning them because I felt guilty about that $140 purchase. So I thought that's how I was going to feel when I bought my first property and was pretty anxious about it and actually had some issues with closing on our first one because my husband was deployed and there was something wrong with our, um, our power of attorney or whatever he had to sign. And of course I couldn't get a hold of him when I was at the title company and it was just such a pain. And I thought maybe that was a sign I shouldn't be investing. I shouldn't buy this. And I almost let that deter me from moving forward, um, which, but I'm glad I did not because I finally closed on that one. And I realized like I saw the power of real estate and I saw that money get put to work and I felt like I was investing it, investing that money rather than spending that money and have seen it grow every day. And I've seen that property appreciate and it, it appreciated even from the time that we bought it to the time that we closed on it. So to have sort of some instant equity and we got some extras, um, when we closed, 
And it, yeah, it's just, I just kind of really saw the power behind it and I was hooked from that very first one. So I, I was able to scale it quickly just because I saw um, that it could, it could give me something to do, keep me occupied, but also pay, pay fairly well um, and still allow me to stay at home with my kids. Okay. So you live in California, right? You say Monterey. The, uh, the property. So let's, let's go back a little bit. I just want to, I just want to people to, to see kind of the, the timeline. You got out of the army. What year did you start investing? When, when did everything start? So I started investing in uh, 20, the beginning of 2018. Okay. Um, so just over two years now that we've owned, we owned our first rental. Um, and that one was in Clarksville, Tennessee. So we were stationed at Fort Campbell at the time. And that's still my main market, Clarksville and Nashville, um, and have a great team there. But I knew that eventually I was going to become a long distance investor. I knew the army was going to move us. So kind of had that in the back of my mind the whole time, like, how am I going to make sure that this can transfer make sure I can take it with me and sort of built the systems to support that. But what I didn't realize was how much moving away from it would free up more like would free me up because I no longer, I didn't have an option to be involved in the flips or to, to actually manage the projects or manage any of my rentals. I was managed managing some of my higher end rentals at the time, but so I moved away, had to pay a little bit more money to have my property managers cover down on those doors, but it has provided, it's allowed me to do so much more in the same amount of time. Nice. Nice. So all your rentals, is it, they're in Tennessee. And uh, how, so you were moving out. Did, was it kind of scary? Were you nervous that, hey, we're moving away? And did you ever thought of selling everything? And it, how, how was that? How was that process? No, I never, I've never considered selling anything, honestly, until about now, until kind of coronavirus and pending recession, and then just worrying about um, liquidity, and then worrying about sort of my higher end rentals with two higher end um, units, I should say highest end in their respective markets. So those ones are a little bit worrisome to me in terms of keeping a tenant in there. They're hard, it's hard enough to find tenants in those properties as is. So we actually put those on the market. So hopefully those will sell soon, get us a little bit of capital. And then we're going to stick with sort of the B class properties. Um, it's kind of something in the middle and good school districts and hopefully take advantage of some great opportunities, um, you know, with the current environment. But when we moved, no, I was nervous just about the business in general. You know, I had, I had worked really hard to get it to the point where it was. Um, but I, so I was just kind of worried about how that would be. But it, it, I never wanted to, I never wanted to sell it. I just was worried about the ability to continue to scale it. Okay, nice. And how many, how many doors do you have right now? How many units? Uh, 26 or 27 doors now. So 27 doors in two years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And okay. done, I've done a couple of flips in there as well that we've gotten rid of. Uh, that's pretty cool. And the flips, they're also, you, you manage those long distance or are they here in California? So I, I've not done anything in California. We're just now looking into the California market. Once these two sell, I'm looking to do a 1031 exchange. Um, that'll be the first getting into California. When we first got here, I looked into the market and there was just major insurance implications with the fires. And it was really hard to get insurance policies. So um, I didn't really look very hard at that point, but that's getting better. So we're going to start looking again. Um, but we... The flips I've done, I've done three flips now that I've never even seen. I've never, I've never set foot in those properties. Um, I, they're all in the, um, actually no, four. There's two in San Antonio and two in the Nashville area. No, actually three in the Nashville area. So these are properties I've never seen. Um, mm. And it's in some ways, I think I'm, I'm a bit of a control freak. Actually, I'm a super control freak. <laughs> I've definitely learned that. Um, I, I guess I've always known that, but shelter in place has made that much more clear. Um, but for some reason, being removed from it and not being allowed to like be in everybody's business has not only streamlined the whole process and made my team's job so much easier, but it's really forced me to trust them, which one project went fairly badly and went, actually went really badly and it really bit me in the butt. Um, that kind of that mentality of like trusting them, believing what they say. But for the most part, that was a lesson I learned. I, I created some new systems to make sure that didn't happen again. 
and the loss on that was easily made up for, you know, on the other ones that we were doing. So definitely a bit of a learning curve, but for the most part, that has been really good. And the people that I have on my team are appreciative of that, the way that we've set that up and that I do give them that freedom and trust them. And we sort of set up like reporting processes and timelines and it's going fairly well. I mean, I'm sure we'll have issues again at some point, but um, we're getting to a good, a good system. Nice. That's awesome. So you transferred your uh, officer managerial skills over to your real estate business. And I love it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when you, you know, when you first started this two years ago, how do you decide what your niche was going to be, right? There's so many strategies, wholesaling, flipping, you name it. It sounds like yours are, are flipping and buying hold. Um, so how did you get to that point? It's like, this is what I'm going to do. This is it. And are you looking at other strategies in the future? Yeah. So it's actually interesting you say that because flipping is not something I want to do forever. It's, it doesn't really fit into my model. I want to be in control. And you know, when you're working with construction, you don't decide when there's a problem. You don't decide when your contractor needs to get a hold of you or when you have to do something, you know, to, to deal with an issue or whatever. So that's not something that I want to do forever. I do that just to generate income. And when there's, um, when there's a good deal, that's like, I just don't want to pass it up. But I think after, after these couple, we're probably going to take a little bit of a break from that and get back to what's important, which is building the legacy. Like build, I have, you can probably see this stuff behind me. These are like my goals and my why, and it's all about building a portfolio because my husband can retire in nine years. And so I want to be to the point where I have at least $10,000 in passive income at that, that time as well. And I can have the same flexibility that he has. Um, not to say that I want to retire because I truly enjoy this, but I want to have that passive income that just gives me more freedom. And then we've also gotten into um, wholesaling uh, to just continue to go, you know, basically wanted to go direct with the seller because we were buying most of our deals through wholesalers and they were the ones that were making the money, right? They would make more than I would. And all they did was assign the contract when I was the one taking on all the risk and doing all the renovations. So I was like, why aren't, why aren't we doing this? Why don't we go direct with the seller? So we've been doing that um, for the last couple of months. And it's, I, that's actually been really fulfilling for me because you get, you can talk with the seller, you can figure out what their issues are and try to solve a creative, a problem, solve a problem creatively for them. And then also create an opportunity for me or my clients who end up buying those properties. Um, so that's given us a little bit of uh, a little bit of flexibility to build the portfolio and then also just bring in some more passive income than flipping. Okay. So I see that you have a, um, uh, what is it? Like a vision board behind you for those of you who are not, uh, seeing us and just listening to the podcast. Uh, you have a pretty nice, and I was going to ask you about that before, because I see like a luxury car back there and I see kind of like pictures of properties and, and, and uh, uh, numbers. And, and so it's, it's kind of cool. So what's, what's the goal uh, for you guys? Where, wh how, how far do you want to take this? Yeah, so the end goal is $20,000 per month in passive income. So within the next nine years, I want to get to 10000 per month. And we're, we're about halfway there. We're like forty six or $4,800 a month. Um, and, but yeah, it's just, it's just about that, um, that passive income. And it's not, it's not about the money, right? Like these these things up here, like you see that car, I don't really care about cars, but I want to yeah. be able to buy a car cash and not think about it. And I want to be able to just buy a beach property just for the freedom, you know, so we can travel there anytime or take the girls to the beach or whatever. So it's the money is the tool and the engine and our lives haven't changed, even though we've, we make a lot more money passively, um, which it, it all just fuels, like it all just goes right back into the business and continuing to build this. So for us, it's not about like, we don't necessarily want to live like a luxurious lifestyle, but we want to have freedom. And when our kids are, when we can both retire, like I said, in nine years, our oldest will be 13 and our youngest will be 10. And so we can, we want to be able to like coach their soccer team or, you know, do whatever it is that yeah. we're, we want to at that point. Yeah, I, I can I, I can relate with you. I re, I retired next year, and, and that's basically what I wanted. I wanted to spend more time with my kid and be to every soccer practice, every uh, play that they do on, on school and stuff like that. Uh, so that's pretty amazing. Now, I we get a lot of questions. My brother and I get a lot of questions, and, and we actually had this question too in regards to risk, right? Because 
when you get into this, um, into real estate or any type of business, we always, and, and you're not a business person, you're always being tied to a career where you get paid every two weeks and you got all these benefits and, and you can't kind of, um, um, in, the, in the system of just, you know, you, you're an employee and, and you try to do something for yourself, right? You hear people talking just like you were, Oh my God, in two years, you got to, to, uh, over, over 20 doors and now you're getting passive income and, and, but it's a risky, people think that it's a risky business. Um, and they tend to hear more of like, okay, this is too risky. What if I mess up? What if I do this? And, and what if I'm not successful at this? Um, can you talk to us about how to mitigate those, those risks, the, the fear, um, what are, I mean, we hear the benefits, right? You're talking about passive income and, and how you can actually foresee your future and, and having all this freedom, right? Um, for the people that are trying to get into this and, and, and they, don't, they don't believe it, they think it's too good to be true. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's, that's the power right there. So I know that um, the 88% of millionaires are self-made and 90% of millionaires make their money in real estate. So for those doubters, that those, those are true numbers. Those are stats right there. Like those numbers don't lie. So this is a proven industry. And that's what I've, I've had to remind myself on many occasions. But that, like you said, it doesn't mean it's without risk. There is a lot of risk, but there's ways to hedge against that risk. Um, and there's ways to I think what, what separates real estate from a lot of the other investment opportunities is the ability to leverage it. Like you can't go to the stock market and say you want to buy however many shares, but you're only going to put 20% down. That doesn't, doesn't work like that. Right. So it's a, it's a really cool way to leverage what you do have. And then there's so many creative ways to get into it without your own money, which again, like you're not going to go to your friend and say, Hey, can I borrow $10,000 to invest in stocks? Cause your friend's going to be like, well, no, I'll just invest that money myself. Right. Yeah. But you can set up cool partnerships and things like that in real estate. Um, but as far as the risk goes, it's, it isn't risk-free. Um, but there are ways that you can definitely sort of, um, hedge against that risk and make sure that your, you know, the benefits will, will kind of out, outpace any of those risks. And so I think right now, my, my opinion of risk has changed a little bit. And my opinion of, of debt has changed, you know, before coronavirus, I was fine with getting these short term hard money loans for flips. And now I'm seeing that that to me now seems like bad debt, you know, you don't know how long it's going to take you to sell a property. So maybe having a balloon payment at six or nine months is it might not be a good idea. Um, and if you're a type of person who's more comfortable with risk, then go for it. But I'm not. And I literally lose sleep at night thinking about that kind of stuff. So I've, my, pro, my thought process on that has changed a little bit. And the only time I'll take advantage of something like that, that I do consider risk-free is if there is a huge opportunity for a profit or a huge opportunity for a payout. And that far outweighs the risk. Um, but I think for the beginners, probably staying away from flips, especially right now is probably pretty good. Um, but sticking with those like middle, middle of the road kind of properties, B class properties, maybe even C class properties in good neighborhoods, um, are, is a great way to, um, kick off your investing career because those are the properties that you're not going to have a hard time putting tenants in. And then if you buy, right, it's all about buying, right. You know, it's just like anything else you have to buy at the right price. You have to know how to know what that right price is and try to get that equity off the bat and then put the, put a down payment in that makes sure that even if there's a dip, you're not ever going to be underwater. Um, and just making sure that you're like worst case scenario, you, you're never going to owe more on the property than the property's worth. I think that's really how you, um, hedge against that risk and make sure that you're not putting yourself in a position where you'd have to get rid of it. And then for me, separating personal from the business has made a huge difference. Like we pretty much live off of my husband's income. I get some GI bill and a little bit of VI, VA disability. So that's like our, our income to spend and live off of the business money stays within the business and it goes back into the business and what money that we, we like invested in the business. And that's what our, our reserve fund is our CapEx account. 
and we don't ever dip into that unless a property needs that. So I won't buy another property until I feel like I have enough reserves to do that. And again, that's not, it's more of an art than a science and it's, it has to do with your comfort level. But I think at the end of the day, just buying right, buying for the right price, making sure you have some equity in it, whether you put a down payment down or whether you're just getting a good deal and making sure that you can keep good quality tenants in there is a really good, good place to start. Nice. Let me, let me ask you the, uh, so it seems like you have a lot of systems, right? I just want to ask you like one specific in regards to, uh, you say cash reserves. Do you have a specific amount or a specific percentage that you want to keep as cash reserves per property or per deal? Uh, not, not really. Um, I just actually talked to somebody the other day who's looking to buy, um, seven units. And I said to him, I was like this, the way that I would, plan for reserves on that is plan for every one of your tenants to not pay and you'd have to evict all of them and then flip that unit. So how much is that going to cost per door? Cause that in my experience, when you buy a prop, when you buy a rented property, tenants either stop paying or maybe they weren't paying at all. And so I wonder if that's why most of them sell. Um, so I was like, plan to have to evict all your tenants, worst case scenario, and then plan to have to flip the property new, you know, patching some walls, repainting new flooring, maybe some new appliances. I was like, figure out what that's going to cost you for that particular unit in that area at that price point, And then multiply that by seven, cause that's how many doors. And then add a little bit to that, um, and make sure that you also have some, some resources you can tap into if something even worse happens. Um, but if you have an insurance policy, in some ways, like having a catastrophe is a good thing as a landlord, as long as, you know, nobody gets hurt. Um, but if, if a tornado comes through and everybody's fine, but you get a new roof and you only pay $1,000 or $2,500, like that's a win in my book. So yeah. if you have your umbrella policy and your insurance policy, and then you have those reserves, I think you're, you know, you're going to be fine. Right. So what is, uh, what's your next step? What is your, your goal? Your I know you have a vision board and you guys want to go, you know, in the next nine years, want to have that passive income, but what is your, your next step right now as far as scaling? So I have, um, this quarter, I'm going to buy three more doors. Um, some of that is dependent on selling those two that I was telling you about, because we're going to do a 1031 exchange. So we're planning for those to figure out what we're going to invest that money in. And then Still, while we're wholesaling, I think for now, I'm going to focus on seller finance deals. Um, so I'm probably getting to the, the cap of what any bank is going to give me at this point. Um, so focusing on seller financing and subject to, which I think will be, there'll be a lot of opportunity for that coming up here soon. Um, and then once we sell those two, just really buy as many doors as we can with those proceeds um, and, mm -hmm. and maximize returns. Oh, that's great. So then um, from here, what do, you, what do you recommend as far as books or anything a, a newbie should, should read to get into this? So for newbies, I think that something that uh, it's, there's so many resources out there. There's a ton of podcasts. There's so many books. It's really easy to, to get all convoluted in like your path. I think you need to figure out what is progressive, what is what progress looks like and what sort of just being busy is. Um, so I think starting with your why, like we were talking about, what are you working toward? What are your ultimate goals? And a lot of people will say financial freedom. Well, what does that mean to you? Like put a dollar amount to it and then give yourself a deadline and then work backward, you know, plan from there and figure out exactly where you are right now. Take a look at your spending, take a look at what your, um, savings accounts have right now. Do you have money in your IRA? Do you have a 401k? What kind of, where, where can you put that money to work to contribute toward your goals and then make a plan to get there? Right. So I think in the beginning, a lot of it needs to be focused on mindset and then building the network. You know, I think that the more that you surround yourself with people who are doing really well, the more motivating and encouraging it's going to be, especially if you adopt sort of a a mindset of abundance and knowing that there's the deals are plentiful and you know you don't look at everybody as competition you're just going to inevitably elevate your game and you're going to be able to do so much more because of those relationships and then not to mention the tangible things that they can help you with contracts or further connections or even providing you deals so i think in the beginning it's figuring out what you're working toward getting really real and really honest with yourself especially like in times like this when we're about to 
go into a recession, it can be really hard to stay motivated through that and not become like overwhelmed with fear. And then just sticking to a plan and always having that mindset. And that's not to say that you're not going to have doubts. I mean, there's days where I'm like, I feel like I'm over my head and I, and over my head and I feel like maybe I should just sell everything and hold on to my money and never, never let it leave my bank account again. But those, those moments are few and far between. And I, I usually have to talk myself out of them or have somebody talk me out of them. Um, but I think focusing on mindset in the beginning and building the network is probably the best thing you can do. Yeah. Awesome. That's great advice. I, I got I gotta just one or two questions before we wrap up because I think we could talk hours with you because I mean you have so much to, to share. Um, you talk about connections, right? And um, in, in so do you do you partner up with people or you everything that you're doing right now is, is on your own by yourself? Uh, we've done a combination of everything. We've done partnerships. We've done um, joint venture rehabs. We've done a lot of different things. And I, I just think having that like open mind uh, toward a deal and not having too specific of criteria. I think you have to have criteria. You need to know what your threshold is. That's how you um, hedge against risk. We were talking about. Um, but I think knowing, you know, I sort of have like a, a return on investment threshold when I do a flip and then when I buy a property. Um, so if they meet that, then I'm going to figure out how to put that deal together. And if I can't do it by myself, I'm going to pull in partners. Um, and if I have partners who maybe don't want to actually be partners, but they want to loan me some money, then we set up um, a situation where they just loan me the money. I give them a promissory note. And we, I just think getting creative and putting the deal together is really what it's all about. Like there, there are lots of deals and there are lots of ways to put deals together, lots of ways to buy real estate, lots of ways to fund real estate and just wrapping your head around that. And once you find the deal, like not letting it go, kind of running it down is that's really fun for me. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say it's awesome. I, we, we had so much fun doing that, um, chasing the deal and, and getting it wrapped up and, and work, work out on your, on your benefit is, is amazing. Yeah. And one last question too. So right now we're, we're dealing with this coronavirus, right? You're an investor, we're investors. Everybody has their own little, um, uh, you say, criteria, and, 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 and we have different perspective on how or what to do in this situation. Uh, what's your, what's your, um, um, your recommendation for people that are trying to invest right now? Would you recommend them to get into it right now, or would you recommend it for them to see how the market behaves and do it later on? I definitely say continue to move forward because this is, this is an industry that scales and this, the work that you do now and the relationship that relationships you build will pay huge dividends down the road. So continue to pursue it and you will probably need to have more in reserve now. Um, you definitely will need to have more in reserve now because there are tenants who can't pay and there are it's harder to get a hold of money. Like if you have equity in a property, a lot of banks aren't even doing cash out refinances. It just is harder to, to get money in some ways. Um, in other ways, it's actually, there's great opportunity to get capital and SBA loans and things like that. But um, for those of you that get, are getting started and can't take advantage of those, make sure you build in a little bit of a buffer and make sure you have your contingency plans. Make sure you always have multiple exit strategies. So if you do decide to do a flip, you need to be really certain that it's going to sell on the backside in a certain amount of time, which is hard, hard to say right now. So have a plan B. If you can turn that into a rental and you can refinance it, then that's a great opportunity to continue to kind of build, build toward those same goals. Maybe you have to sell it in two years or, you know, 18 months or whatever, but just have a plan B and just be a little extra cautious. But I think now is the time for cautious optimism. I think there's going to be great opportunities. And if you choose to sideline yourself and you choose to tell yourself like now is not the time, then for you, it's not going to be the time. And someone else is going to snatch up all that value and someone else is going to take advantage of the things that you could have. 100%. That's great advice. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Erin. It was amazing. Everything that you had to share. Uh, can you please share with us how can people contact you? Because I know you like to uh, mentor others and, and share your story. Uh, so can you please tell our audience how can they find more about you and where can they reach you? Yeah, so I'm on Instagram at the Aaron Helly and Facebook, uh, the Aaron Helly as well. And my website is bcglobalinvestments.com. 
My email is Erin, E-R-I-N, at bcglobalinvestments.com. Thank That's you awesome. so much for your time. Thank you, Thank guys. you, Erin. Thank you for coming on. We appreciate it. Thank you.